Okay, it is 1.30. Um, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us to kick off the Safe Street Summit. We are thrilled you are participating in this timely discussion about trail-oriented development and how to create equitable communities. My name is Patrice Gillespie-Smith and I am the Chief, Op uh, Chief Operating Officer with the Underline. We are excited because as COVID has played out, we have seen, next slide please. <laughs> One more, please. We are excited because as we've seen this pandemic play out, we've seen more and more people investing in bikes. Next slide. But the big question is how do we leverage this excitement? Uh, we have seen these kinds of upticks before in the 1970s during the oil crisis. So we wanna make sure that we act strategically and keep this critical mass. Well, now is a time when everyone is biking and walking. Next slide, please. It's also a time, next slide, when we are seeing some alarming trends. Uh, one is our housing and transportation cost is 52% of the average salary. And so that really makes us question with an unemployment rate that is 6.1% here in the state of Florida, and with looming budget cuts, can we shrink the transportation cost for underserved communities? Can we make the car truly optional? And can trails help everyone live fuller and longer lives? Next slide, please. The biggest question about making those lives longer and fuller is looking at our pedestrian fatalities. As you can see, um, and this may be difficult to see, but quite honestly, the US is leading the world as far as our percentage of fatalities in the nation. So as you can see, lots of European nations are experiencing a decline and yet the US is still going up. Next slide, please. Likewise with uh, cyclists, you can see the United States isn't the worst, but still we're very close. Next slide. And Florida, as I'm sure you've heard numerous times, is still leading the pack. Uh, we did have a 3% increase between 2018 and 2019. Next slide. And then when you look at overall, after 2009, the US had a nice dip and yet we've been climbing back to pre-1990 uh, statistics again, which is very frightening. And what I found most frustrating about this research was that when I asked locally if anyone had 2020 bike and ped fatality and crash rates, I couldn't find anyone who owned the data. And yet I know uh, there's a university that collects it on a daily basis. I'm a firm believer that what gets measured gets done. And the fact that no one is staying up at night tracking these numbers is concerning and even more frightening. So that's why you know today we're talking about trails because many people believe it's these off-road uh, facilities are what that is what is gonna save us. Next slide, please. Today though, we have an amazing panel of speakers who are at various phases of trail development to share their insights on how to ensure their multimodal parks are an asset for all users in a community rather than a select population. Before I introduce our star-studded panel, I do have a couple housekeeping items. One is we will have question and answer session after the presentation, so please enter your questions for our presenters in the chat box. And two, the session is closed captioning enabled. Please click on the closed caption button in your Zoom toolbar and choose the option to show the live transcript. Additionally, for those who are visually impaired, the session is compatible with NVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver, and Android Trailback screen readers. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Victor Dober, one of Miami's leading street specialists, an urban design and town planner, and the co-founder of Dober, Cole, and Partners. Over the last 30 years, his practice has focused on regenerating sound neighborhoods as the fundamental building blocks of well-loved communities. Victor is deeply involved in reforming street design and infrastructure planning. His firm recently crafted plans for West Ashley Greenway in Charleston and the Ludlam Trail in Miami-Dade. And many of you may be familiar with uh, his award-winning Clematis Street in West Palm Beach. Victor is also a five-time Ironman triathlete and bikes to work. Welcome, Victor. Thank you, Patrice. You know, working in this space, you can't help but be struck by how interdependent all the components are, 
how connected everything is to everything else, or at least it should be. So that's why I think it's perfectly appropriate to be talking about trails at a streets conference. Uh, and you can take the next one, Jesse. Yeah, so I'm going to talk through the lens of the Lotham Trail, which is a journey we've been taking along with AECOM and uh, the Miami-Dade Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Department. I'm going to talk about three things. Growing a network, not just projects. Making a bigger menu of mobility and experiences through these interventions. And then when you do these interventions, how you can challenge yourself to make the network more accessible to everyone, regardless of ages and abilities. So let's start with that network idea. It's pretty easy to think of a corridor project, whether a complete street or a greenway trail as a standalone project, one line, a stick on a map. Um, Ludlam Trail will start a little over five miles, grow to a little over six miles, connecting north-south from Dadeland area to the airport area. And by itself, Ludlam Trail will be pretty darn cool. It's got a transportation corridor aspect where there's a separated bikeway and walking running path. It's also a linear park, uh, meant to be a memorable a restoration landscape and, and, and an experience, not just a way to get somewhere else. But we very quickly figured out that that's the Ludlam Trail is actually just one piece of a much larger, bigger system that taken together with the underline and the Miami River Greenway, uh, it will form what Mati Chael first nicknamed the Miami Loop. So there's a whole lot to link here. The, um, the trail will end up connecting an incredible array of destinations, including centers for employment and retail, schools, parks, transit corridors, three future mixed use areas of private development. Those are the so-called nodes. The county bought the land in between those nodes and is creating the trail there, and the private developers are completing the trail within the nodes. And then all the parties are collaborating to build bridges over the biggest roads. What's important to realize here is that most of these destinations are today for all intents and purposes, almost impossible to reach without using a car and Ludlam Trail end up connecting them all for walking and biking and it'll extend, we hope, the usefulness of the transit systems as part of a first and last mile solutions. So we're talking about the other TOD, trail oriented development. Uh, but whether transit oriented or trail oriented, it only works if you feel welcome getting across the roads that parallel and intersect your walkways and bikeways. And I know Meg Daly will have more to say about that uh, in just a minute. But if you can make it look like pedestrians are supposed to be there and you can make the crossings noticeable, you can make it safer. You can also amplify the effect of say an East Coast Greenway seen here or an Underline or a Ludlam Trail. So one of the primary focuses for Ludlam has been exactly that, making the crossings, and there are a lot of them, really evident and safe and setting up the crossing streets themselves for calmer traffic and easier trips to the trail. And there's a whole lot to be done on these tributaries. And so I'm especially happy to see things like this popping up. That's the first short segment of protected bike lanes under construction on one of the perpendicular streets, Southwest 64th Street in South Miami, key link between the underline and the University of Miami. And uh, you know, this little project here is just a start, but it's a, hopefully a sign of what's to come. So you're making a corridor, a greenway corridor, and you're making new links that heal ruptures in the network, not just with trips along it, but with trips across it. So we made this interactive map so people can go online and zoom in and swipe along and see all those connections and how the trail is supposed to work in their neighborhood. This is a concept plan. Uh, on the screen, you'll see Southwest 48th Street and how the trail will allow folks on either side to walk across the trail, not just uh, where now there's a fence blocking them off to see their neighbors, not just to uh, move along the trail. So I'm asking you to see your project as a way of expanding the menu of choices, especially for short trips and for trips that involve green mobility options. And if you'd like to see the interactive map, here's a link. You can access it from the county website or our website. Ultimately, the trail isn't just for walking or biking. It's also for runners and for folks in wheelchairs and folks making purposeful trips like trips to work, not just fun and fitness trips. So third, that's why the all ages and abilities ethos, well, I hope you all were bringing to your complete streets projects, needs to extend into the way we make trails and greenways and the way we configure trail oriented development. For example, we know Ludlam Trail will have lots of able-bodied, young, fit, fearless users, but it will also have grandparents uh, and folks who are not as confident uh, in these public spaces. And, so, and not just cyclists, but folks on two wheels where the wheels are side by side instead of one behind the other. 
so much more is understood now uh, about how to make a place reachable and enjoyable for everybody, including people with disabilities. So it's not just a matter of meeting the minimum requirements of the ADA, but leveling up. So in Miami, we have brilliant people uh, to guide us on this, like the writer, Steve Wright. He, he had this picture in a recent article that really struck me uh, as what we're up to here. So it's been a point of pride from the beginning for the design team to emphasize this aspect of the project and all the visuals and all the details and how we tell the story of the trail. But if you wanna get all people, people of all ages and abilities across certain big roads without delay uh, as part of the story, uh, you'll eventually come to the question of bridges. And there are four bridges planned as part of the Ludlam Trail. I will tell you that naturally I approach this subject with some trepidation as an urbanist, given all the failures of various kinds of bridges. This photo went viral not long ago with the caption, pedestrian bridges in a nutshell. And you know, and then there's the, the recent tragedy experienced here in Miami when the FIU bridge fell, fell. So everybody has that you know, in our minds. It was a really tragic event in which the accelerated bridge construction was so accelerated, partly to get the traffic moving underneath again, just a little sooner. It made me and Kenneth Garcia who made this picture question what the so-called pedestrian bridge is really for. Useful for people walking back and forth between campus and Sweetwater. And I think the real origin was a kind of surrender to the cars on 8th Street as if there was no other way to get commuters east and west. Of course there is, we, they, we could install transit like we mean it, and the bridge is about getting those pesky pedestrians out of the way so the intersections, the car, the cars intersections wouldn't suffer delays. So calling it a pedestrian bridge when it's really about making single occupant car trips easier seems like a euphemism. So when it came to the bridges on Ludlam Trail, we've been thinking about that. And so we've been advocating a more inclusive and intermodal approach. Now for somebody just blowing through on the trail, say from the bottom to top, north, south to north on this map, the bridge will be super. It'll help you get across faster without waiting for traffic signals. But for someone interacting with all the destinations at the ground plane, there's a lot more to be done. The last thing we wanna do is make the city even worse down below the bridge. So when we got involved, we were pretty surprised to discover that the public stairs and elevators weren't really being contemplated as part of the bridges or the private development nodes. I want you to consider for a moment, look in your lower right-hand corner at the person in a wheelchair along the sidewalk that wants to reach the park across the street or wants to catch the bus going the opposite direction. They have to start off going in the opposite direction from the way they really wanna go um, and, and head toward the bottom of the ramp if there's no stair and elevator. Um, and if the only way to cross is up above on the bridge, then they have to get up there. So that means they have to go all the way down in the opposite direction till they reach the trail at the bottom of the ramp, turn around, and then they have to go all the way up and up and up and until they finally reach the point right above where they were in the first place, and then go across and then repeat the whole process down, 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 and then you turning at the bottom of the ramp and then going all the way back. Um, and so by the time we're done with that one half mile long trip um, for an, an ADA slope ramp, then uh, we're finally across the, street, across the street. So folks, I would just say, this is something to think about. These situations call for at grade crosswalks and if you have a bridge, also stairs and elevators, uh, both and not either or. If we're really smart about these nodes, like these, they can be great places as mobility hubs, you know, for switching between the modes and maybe even making the corridors that are perpendicular to the trail smarter and smarter over time. So that's it. I wanted to give you those three big ideas. The Flagler Street Bridge is a place where you can see this. We've illustrated not an abandonment of the ground plane, but an invigoration of it and with the bridge as a bonus. Three questions you can ask. Are you growing a more interconnected network? Are you expanding the choices and are you finding ways to make it for everybody? So thank you very much. I, I, that's my intro. I look forward to the discussion, Patrice, and uh, for people who wanna track me down or access the interactive map, here are the links. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, wow, very thought provoking and great visuals to demonstrate the challenges we are asking some of our ADA populations to um, endure, incredible. It's now my pleasure to introduce Meg Daly. Hopefully many of you know her. It has been my pleasure to work closely with her for the last almost year at the Underline. And I can assure you there's no one more dedicated to improving the safety of our streets than Meg. She is the founder and president of the Friends of the Underline. 
and she's leading the initiative to transform the underutilized land below Miami's Metro Rail in a 10 mile urban trail and linear park. A 30 year sales and marketing veteran, Meg owned First Media Direct, but she's also held executive positions in public relations, advertising, technology, and real estate industries. Take it away, Meg. Thank you, Patrice. Boy, it's always great to follow Victor because now all of you feel enlightened and inspired. So thank you, Victor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you can tell, we are a friends-led organization and we have um, a big vision uh, to create this 10-mile linear park trail as well as public art destination below Metro Rail, which is really this forgotten land below, you know, below our elevated train. And what's amazing about this is since I've been working in this project, we've had all these other great things happen in Miami-Dade County, including our collaboration with the Loveland Trail, as well as other you know, trail projects, because it's not just one, it's many that make the system work. Next slide. Well, we have some pretty important goals, uh, we believe, um, actually focusing a lot on diversity and inclusivity um, innovation, health and wellness, sustainability, and safety and mobility, connectivity, but we also have to have fun because all many of us are volunteers. Um, I'm a full-time volunteer. I've been doing this for seven years uh, since we embarked on working on the underline. But each one of the speakers are going to focus on um, a piece of their project that ties to equity. And one of the challenges that we all have, and Victor did a great job of illustrating the problem at the street, how do we get people to feel safe to ride a bike, to walk on a trail in the urban um, in the urban core? Because it's really in Miami not designed for people on bike or on foot. And if you feel safe, it is more equitable and everybody is welcome there. Next slide. So the underline, just to give you a sense of our footprint, goes from downtown Miami all the way to Dayland South, one of the unique, unique features of the project is it runs right through eight transit stations, which makes this a multimodal corridor. In fact, most of our funding has come from transportation dollars, uh, not from park dollars. Um, roughly 250,000 people live within a bike ride, which is um, about 15 minute bike ride. And we front 24 schools, the University of Miami, a number of anchor institutions, 14,000 businesses, and we also now have the redevelopment of these transit stations, which will bring hopefully more people to place in a more equitable way with a focus on affordable housing and workforce housing. So many people can live alongside this great amenity. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the numbers? Um, Patrice said early on, you know, we all sort of live and die by our metrics. And um, a lot of people don't know that the underline serves sort of like a slice of Miami. Um, underserved, served populations, um, over 30% of the people living within our impact zone make a household income of less than $35,000 a year. Um, and then it scales up to um, predominantly Hispanic. Um, and we have a really diverse um, approach where downtown Brickell is very dense, but we also go through a number of bedroom communities that we hope to um, respect as this project continues to grow. Next slide. So since seven years, um, the project has secured the bulk of its construction funding. Um, the funding gets directed to Miami-Dade County um, who builds and then the project is then returned by phase to our management organization, which is a quasi conservancy. We're working now on funding that conservancy as we um, are already in construction on the first phase, phase two is in design, phase three is going into procurement um, to identify a design build team. Next slide. So in one of those public meetings, this is now our eighth um, that we've had over the past couple of years. The most recent one, we asked people, what's your primary focus for the underline? And people were loud and clear, safety is first. When you go into the underline, I'll run you through some of the pictures, I'll tell you why people don't feel safe. Mobility, connections, exercise in nature and relaxing. And I'm excited to say that we prioritize those really because that's what the people have said all along. Next slide. So that's what the underline looked like seven years ago uh, when I was walking below it after I'd had a bike accident and broke both of my arms. And I thought, wow, um, I don't see a problem here. We see opportunity. 
So let me go to the next slide. This is what the underline will look like when it's completed. Uh, two separated uh, trails, much like Ludlam Trail, um, all native vegetation. There currently is no lighting, no water, no infrastructure. And we also, and I'll get to the um, intersection improvements. Next slide. And the first phase is just a half mile long. We've been in construction for two years. Our design team is James Corner Field Operations out of New York. They viewed every block as sort of having its own distinct feature. Next slide. And this is what it's actually looking like today. We're about to open, hopefully knock on wood in a couple of weeks. We're very excited. You can see on the right, we have the bike trail. On the left, one of the pedestrian pieces always separated. And what you're not seeing is this topography that allows for drainage. This is soft green infrastructure. And we also don't see is all the beautiful butterflies that have sort of taken over. Uh, this is turning into a 10 mile pollinator park. Next slide. We're gonna have an outdoor gym uh, with basketball, soccer, stretching stations, strengthening stations. And this was all dirt, mind you. And we now have James Harden playing basketball there. Next slide. Uh, we have a sound stage. This is right by 8th Street for yoga, cultural programs. You can see the construction fences up, but when those construction fences come down, this is completely porous. And this is a transit hub for bus, trolley, uh, metro rail transfer. So there's a lot of activity uh, despite the programming we're going to put in place. Next slide. And this is what we're all about, celebrating nature. This is what we call the Oolite Room. There are these beautiful sort of monolithic rocks that we said nobody knows is here, but we're going to celebrate them. And it's actually provides some of our seating. Next slide. And then as you go through each community in each neighborhood, there's sort of a different story to tell. Um, Coconut Grove has historically had this incredible culture of art. Uh, we have technology areas. We have those sleepy bedroom communities that say we want to connect to you. And we respect what the people want based on what's been there before and what it will be in the future. Next slide. So let's talk about infrastructure. Gosh, I love talking about infrastructure. You can tell is someone coming from marketing. Um, but this is really important work, um, separating these trails around an active transit corridor directly adjacent to a major arterial um, took a lot of thought. We have setback conditions um, from Metro Rail. Uh, we have planting conditions, how close we can get to the Metro Rail. And we had to respect all the things going on uh, within the future underline. And really the planning is what's making that happen. Next slide. So this little picture shows you all the crosswalks that have to be improved. There are 34 of them. In the first half mile, uh, we've improved four. Um, very early days of giving tours, nobody stopped. There were no crosswalks. Crossing the street was you know, sort of doing one of these, praying and hoping you didn't get hit. We have put in new crossings, new light fixtures, and people are stopping just because of infrastructure. Uh, next slide. So the minimum improvement, and I believe um, Stuart from uh, Kimley Horn is on, I saw you, he was part of the team that designed this vision, which is pushing the crosswalk away from US-1. No right-hand turn on red, so you can't whip around the corner and run right into the person crossing the street. Widening the crossing to 18 feet, in some cases from eight feet. Um, painting it bright green, right? Which took two years to get approved. Um, and also changing the texture of the, of the path as you approach. Next slide. And then we also have a, um, more approaches for tabled crossings. Uh, we did look at um, um, bridging, um, but because of um, our policy to ADA accessibility, these bridges got quite long. Um, by the way, I wanna share that this is all universal design practices, so everyone um, can, is accessible to the underline. Next slide. So our, our impact, we already have 9 million people transiting through the underline. And we put a lot of thought about like, what are they gonna do there? Uh, are they gonna do yoga? Are they gonna you know, walk their dog? How about just hanging out, come to the underline, just stay for 20 minutes before you get on your train or your bus. Um, I talked about that we have 30,000 new plants and trees just in this first half mile. This is an urban reforestation project. I know that, um, I know that Clyde's gonna do an incredible job talking about economic impact, but these projects really do have a remarkable return on investment with attracting um, development and more people living alongside them. 
And this is really Miami's first multimodal corridor, which is very important for our streets, is how do you get all modes of transit operating together so people feel safe and welcome here? Next slide. So I'll just wrap by we're opening soon, phase two is in design, phase three is underway, it's a seven mile segment, and we're working on an art master plan as well as a technology master plan. At the underline, we do not believe in being bored, like I'm sure many of you don't. Next slide. Thanks so much for your time. I can't wait to hear from Clyde and Victor and Clyde, you both inspire me. Thank you for your stories. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, clearly, I'm a huge fan. And But now it's my honor to introduce one of the nation's leading trail experts, Clyde Higgs. Clyde currently serves as the CEO and president of the Atlanta Beltline. In this role, he leads the executive team in providing oversight of the economic development, design and construction, real estate development, housing, procurement, and human resources activities. He brings 20 years in economic development, real estate, intellectual property development, technology design, real estate, grants, and donor funding. He is also our go-to whenever we have a question about how to build the underline. He has done it all. Welcome, Clyde. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, I appreciate that uh, that really great welcome. Victor, Meg, um, what a great job on that presentation. So it's an honor to, to be on this, uh, this panel with you. And uh, so I, I'm going to talk to you just a, a little bit about uh, the Beltline. We, we feel like we are perhaps one of the, the old kids on the block and uh, have uh, lots of scar tissue to share about uh, perhaps what not to do. Uh, if you will, with regards to these type of infrastructure redevelopment projects. And, and the way we really talk about the, the Beltline, it, it's interesting. Uh, we really are an economic and community development uh, project. <clears throat> and we just happen to use infrastructure as the genre to, to get these community benefits that we're pushing for. And so, so we'll go to the, to the next slide and I'll, I'll give a little more uh, color to that. And, and the way I describe this is because if, if, uh, if you ask people up in Atlanta, you know, what is the Beltline, they will say it is, you know, it will be this 22 mile loop uh, of trails uh, within the, the city. And, and I'm often reminded by a really interesting article that the New York Times produced on us, I want to say maybe three, three and a half years ago, and, uh, and although this, this, uh, this headline may sound like a pejorative, uh, the article was actually uh, a, a good one, but it really described the Atlanta Beltline, again, from a title perspective, as, as a glorified sidewalk. And, and if you go to the next slide, you will know that we are so much more than, than a sidewalk or a glorified sidewalk um, of sorts. It's interesting if, again, if you peel back the, the onion of our project, uh, it is, in my opinion, perhaps one of the most ambitious uh, projects uh, like it in the country because it, it is really comprehensive. Not only are we responsible for this 22 mile trail loop uh, within the city of Atlanta, uh, but we also have responsibility for, for housing affordability within neighborhoods the Beltline will touch. And so I think uh, Meg and Patrice mentioned that the things that are, that are measured get done. So by the end of 2030, we are charged with the creation of 5,600 units of affordable housing along the, the Beltline loop. That, that is significant. And I really have to give a, a shout out to the framers uh, the visionaries behind the belt lines for, for being so uh, thoughtful about what we were bringing. Because our, our project in Atlanta, it is very popular, uh, but we also have the, the tagline of being a gentrification machine with, uh, within the city uh, of Atlanta. And so in ways to, to mitigate that are making sure that neighborhoods that we are touching and we are improving from an infrastructure perspective, 
making sure that those long-term, long-time residents are able to stay in those neighborhoods because one of the things that makes Atlanta cool and funky is our culture. And so you want to make sure that you have this, this really interesting culture to remain uh, in the city. And so, so we really want to make sure the Beltline uh, is a Beltline for, for all. And so that means uh, all races, uh, that means all income levels, that means you know gender, that means you, all the characteristics you can think about. We want to make sure uh, that it is truly a project for, for the entire city. And then even beyond the, the affordable housing side, uh, we also have ambitions to develop rail transit uh, along the, the city of Atlanta as well. Uh, so about three years ago, the city of Atlanta passed uh, a tax uh, called the More Marta uh, sales tax. And this will raise about three and a half billion dollars for rail transit that will ultimately be in the same corridor as our trail. And uh, so this is significant, and this is really where the, the Beltline was born. And, and so our next iteration of our development will include a, a significant uh, thrust on rail transit, again, on the, on the physical Beltline uh, corridor. And then on top of that, when we start talking about the, the Beltline from an economic development perspective, uh, it's an interesting Topic and so so I'm I'm really an economic developer uh, by background and spent you know the bulk of my career on the economic development side and so we've invested about six hundred million dollars into the the Beltline to date uh, we officially started in uh, in two thousand six and so on top of that we have seen a six and a half billion dollar private investment impact that has followed uh, the Beltline investment. And again, so from an economic development perspective, to have a 10 to one return on investment is, is significant. And so we will take those, those, uh, those ratios any day. And on top of that, we start to have this discussion about how do we create places where people can not only live, and thrive and recreate, but they can actually work there as well. And so to date, there have been roughly about 20,000 permanent jobs uh, created along the, the Beltline. Our ultimate goal is to have a, a count of about 30,000 permanent jobs by the end of 2030, with an additional 48,000 temporary construction jobs that were created because of the Beltline. And I will tell you that this is an interesting story here, because for those that uh, that know Atlanta, uh, you may know that our traditional uh, business spine of our city has been north to south, north at, at Buckhead, then you have Midtown and downtown, and, and that has been again the traditional uh, spine for for our business community. Uh, but we have with the the Beltline, and again when when the historians and economists write the, the next 30 years of, of Atlanta, what they are going to talk about is this bowing out of the traditional business district, district, again, that's going north to south to these other corners, if you will. And so on the east side, what I describe as perhaps uh, neighborhood business districts are starting to, to pop up. Uh, we have companies that have been traditionally in you know, the, the big glass tower building, in the traditional business districts that are moving literally right on the, the belt line. So companies like BlackRock, uh, you have Google Fiber, uh, a number of tech companies that are just starting to populate over the belt line because it is truly uh, an engine for economic development and that's a way for them to recruit uh, talent uh, to their companies because that's where young people want to be is, is on the belt line. And so, so that, that is our story in a nutshell. We were definitely more than, than that glorified sidewalk um, that the New York uh, Times described us as. And that uh, you can finally go to, uh, to my slide here and I'll wrap up. The next slide, please. And this is you know, the, 
where we are right now from a, from a, a trail development perspective. Uh, you can see here in the green, those are the trails that have been completed. Uh, you can see in the what we describe as kind of the, uh, the orange side, uh, what's under design uh, or under construction. And then the purple is what we actually have in design right now. And we are in the throes of a major financing discussion where we are trying to put in place uh, the final funding to complete the entire 22 mile loop uh, of the Beltline. And we call it the SSD, uh, the Special Services District. Many communities call it a, a business improvement district or a community improvement district. Uh, but those are some of the conversations that we're having, having right now. And I appreciate uh, having me a part of the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Clyde, so much. Wow, 10 to 1 return on investment. I think uh, there is no widening project in America that can claim that kind of return. Very impressive. Uh, so we have folks 10 minutes left for q and I'm going to kick it off just to get the discussion going, but please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. Um, my first question is, as Victor brought up, this is a safe streets summit. And there's often this debate about how do we make the culture of cycling and walking safer? Do we mainstream it on our existing infrastructure or do we create independent infrastructure such as the trails we are discussing? What's so neat about today's discussion is that all of you have that interaction. None of you have a trail that is completely independent of our roads. So I was hoping you could just shed some light on how you believe we can make our motorists behave more safely and just change the culture in our communities to be more oriented toward all modes. Which of us are you calling on, Patrice? It's any, so whoever wants to step up. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll jump in um, just to say there's two things that occur to me immediately. Uh, first, uh, design matters a whole lot more than, in, uh, than enforcement or signs or even driver education. We, they're all important, but the design is what gives the motorist, the drivest uh, through their windshield, all the cues about whether this is a place to drive in an alert and safe and slow manner um, or not. And if we you know, add wider roads and bigger turning radii and more asphalt and trees farther away and uh, and so on in hopes that people can then interact more safely, they're just gonna speed up. And so uh, all of us have trails that need that attitude shift on the tributary streets that intersect with it and really the, the whole of the network in livable communities as opposed to, you know, the interstate or something. And so there's design matters a whole lot. Second, I would say that the thing that will improve uh, the safety for cyclists probably more than anything else is having a whole lot more cyclists around because we need to alert the drivers. So they need to be, uh, they need to notice that we're there. They need to anticipate that we're going to be there. If they see a lot more of us out on two wheels or two feet, uh, they'll realize that's a place where those interactions are going to occur and their behavior will reflect it. So growing the number of us that are out there is big. You know, a few years ago, Miami hit amazing statistics. Um, we, for several years running, had the fastest growing percentage of bike commuters in the entire country, which is amazing to think about that. Miami, the fastest growing percentage of bike commuters. Until you stop to think that if you start with a small enough number, then it doesn't take very many additional people to make an amazing percentage increase. And that is exactly what that was. So we've got to get more of us doing it. And I think part of that is just uh, getting a lot more people to try it. Uh, the nice thing about the trails and the protected uh, bike lanes and the prototypes and tactical urbanist uh, pop-up tests for safer streets that are going on is they'll give people a taste of it. And, uh, and then if they, they might say, well, wow, I use the trail to get to yoga. Maybe I should use the street uh, or a protected bike lane to get to coffee or to get even to get to work. So um, I think we just need a lot more of us doing it including everybody on the call today. That's a great call to action. Thank you. Uh, we did receive two questions that are rather similar in vain. Um, one is, how do we get private developers to do the right thing with design instead of the minimum requirements when they're right next to a trail? And then another question was, are there any policies that reward tra uh, trail adjacent development uh, for reducing car trips? So I'm not sure who would be best to answer that. Um, 
please take the lead. Yeah, I, I will say a couple of uh, items uh, there. So for development within the, the Beltline catchment area, we call it our, our planning area. Uh, those projects have to become, they become before uh, what we describe as our design review committee. And so, so there is a, a couple of shots for us to, to help tweak uh, anything that is near the, the Beltline. And as you can imagine, we have you know, our own standards and, uh, and protocols on what we want to see uh, along the, the belt line. And so, so ultimately they have to, to come uh, before this DRC, this design review committee uh, that is also served by uh, everyday citizens. It's not just the belt line team, uh, but it's an opportunity for, for professionals um, to come together and, and really help the developers to tweak uh, design. And to Victor's point, design matters all day. Absolutely. That's a fabulous idea. I think we might want to copy that one too. Um, we, we do have, have a similar, we have a similar program on the underlying um, a design advisory committee so that anything adjacent, built adjacent to the underlying um, are also private citizens, as well as our county representatives have to review um, the development. It would be a lot easier if there were changes in zoning code that were enforceable instead of you know, having to be done by, by reviewers. And the complexity of that for our specific project is that we go through three very different municipalities and trying to similarize um, sort of one zoning story for three municipalities is very challenging. So what we're finding is that instead of saying, dragging everybody along, let's do it this way, we're finding, and I see Colin Worth asked one of these questions, is I think the planning departments in those, in those communities and cities are, are really actually being very progressive in their approaches to parking reductions, um, as well as you know, making sure that solid walls don't back up to the underline and those sorts of things. So it's, it's been more of a collaboration on our part rather than saying everybody has to come with us and do it our way. Great point. Meg, my reply will, will rely on you to bounce back with your marketing experience, but it's this. There are places where we work all over the country and we, we find that there are places where we can pretty well count on local government regulation and community pressure to get developers, if they want permission to build, to do the right thing. I can be pretty, pretty confident uh, that if a developer rolls into town in Boulder or Chapel Hill or, um, or Somerville, Massachusetts, that they're going to be surrounded by staffers and community leaders and neighbors who can get the developers to do street oriented urbanism and that is uh, fits with our complete streets approaches or a neighborhood revitalization or historic preservation or trails. Miami-Dade is not one of those places. Um, Miami-Dade is a place where the developers are in charge and there are rules, for example, for those development nodes at the along the Ludlam Trail and they're very loose and they're pretty lax and their the review processes are pretty minimal. And the level of control that the community exerts over those sort of in a top-down enforcement model is, is not enough. Uh, I think, and this is why I mentioned marketing, that the better hope is to draw them not by, out of fear of non-compliance with the rules, but draw them out of desire for making more money with their projects. And you know, why would they miss out on the ability to actually advertise and, and show and showcase and sell uh, the better life you can have with this better designed place? And so the answer is we need better and better developers who are more and more excited about uh, designing street oriented urbanism. We need to reward them with success. You know, if they build a brewery that is street oriented and really faces the trail, I'm gonna go to it. Uh, if they don't, I'm gonna ride past it. <laughs> um, so. I think we need to we, we need to work desire, um, not just uh, rules. Such a good point. I hope we are able to succeed with that, uh, Victor. Uh, we are near the end of our discussion today, and I don't know about all of you listening, but I know I learned a lot of great information and hope to use it as we move forward. But I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. There's a link to the evaluation form in the chat box. Please take a minute to share your thoughts on today's session. 
Um, additionally, there's a link to the Safe Street Summit People's Choice Award where you can cast your vote for your favorite complete streets efforts in Miami-Dade, Broward, and or Palm Beach. And I, I do believe, Victor, that Clematis won last year, right? Yes, so you're looking at a previous winner of the People's <laughs> Choice. So uh, with that, Trace, thank you. Patrice, yeah. thank you. Oh, sure thing, my Absolutely. pleasure. Right. Uh, Thank you, Patrice. Thanks for the invitation, Patrice. And to the summit. Great job. Yes. Looking forward to tomorrow, everybody. Tune in. Thank you.